Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very happy to share the conversation I had with Christian Mespia. Christian is an author, entrepreneur, and academic who focuses on the practical and commercial application of the human sciences. He serves on many boards. He's a part, he's the independent uh, director and chair of the Nomination Governance Committee at Metals Company. He's um, also a director of the Revs Institute, a design museum and research institute. He's also been professor of applied humanities at the New School in New York City. He is the author of many books, including the more recent, Look, How to Pay Attention in a Distracted World. And that is what we talk about in this conversation. We start by talking about why perception and observation are important, uh, generally. We talk about the work of Mario Ponti. Uh, and how his philosophy is really the kind of backbone for, for this new book. We talk about perception being reality, what that means. We talk about intersubjectivity. We talk about the role of the body in phenomenology, phenomenology of space, the other practical ways of paying attention in the world, and uh, many other topics. Uh, I really love this conversation. As soon as uh, he told me that Merle Ponty was very much the kind of uh, you know, backbone shadow over the whole book. I was very happy. I'm a big fan of Murdo Ponti, as some of the listeners will know. And Christian's approach is really to try and take his philosophy and get it distilled in a way that's very uh, tangible for for folks that aren't gonna aren't gonna read a big 700 page uh, philosophy book. Uh, although phenomenology perception is a great book, uh, but he's really doing great things in trying to do kind of applied philosophy in the in the world and how to use the practical. Or to use the concepts in a practical way, and it's uh, it's fantastic what he's doing. Uh, as always, you can find uh, this conversation at Conversion Dialogues at Substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so like, follow, subscribe, share with your friends. Feel free to contribute. All much appreciated, uh, and definitely support Christian. He's a great guy, uh, wonderful thinker, and uh, his his writing is is quite exceptional. So so now I bring you Christian Mespio. I am here with Christian Mespia. Christian, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, greatly looking forward to, to talking with you. Me too. Yeah. Me too. Thank you. Of course. You've written a, a very fascinating, very interesting book, which I really enjoy. Really, I enjoyed it for a variety of reasons. Um, the book is called Look, How to Pay Attention in a Distracted World. Um, and it pulls from a lot of different uh, themes. A lot of philosophy in there, which I was very happy to see, but in a very tangible kind of practical way. Uh, so we'll get all into it. Uh, before we do, why don't you tell listeners um, who you are, kind of professionally, academically, and uh, what you're what you're currently up to? Right. Okay. Well, um, I suppose I'm an observer of profession. So my um, life and career has been about l looking at people and listening to people and trying to figure out why they're doing what they're doing. And I did that as, a, as an advisor for very large companies, so executives in very large companies that wanted to understand what's going on with the people that they serve or work with and so on. Um, and then as an academic, I studied the philosophy behind what perception and attention and observation is. Uh, which is continental philosophy from the 20th century. Uh, and I taught that for a while. Um, so, so observation is kind of the heart of it and has been used in, I've used in many sort of aspects of my work life. Hmm. What, what do you find? I mean, these are all overlapping terms, but they're obviously distinct as well. What do you find is, hmm, I don't want to say human because obviously other animals have observation as well, but what do you think is, I guess, the distinct feature, the defining feature of perception, observation, and things like that? Why is that so critical and important, uh, especially for us as humans, I should say? Right. I mean, it's, I think dolphins and mm -hmm. whales and squirrels have observation mm -hmm. as well. And I think if we found extraterrestrials, they might have a version of it. Mm -hmm. But I think what the kind of observation I'm interested in, the kind of attention I'm interested in, is attention to other humans mm -hmm. and how we somehow have an ability to le live in meaningful worlds. So if a machine looked at a, at, a, at a dinner party, 
it would see colors and shapes and distances and so on. It, but it wouldn't see dinner parties. It, it would see mm. uh, all the different meaningless atomistic data units, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't understand that what you're in the middle of is a dinner party. Mm. And, and that, that, that's quite special about us, that we can pay attention to uh, holes, like holistic um, settings, and we pay attention to, think, to what is meaningful mm -hmm. to us. And that, I think that's quite important. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an important thing about us uh, that's different from, say, a camera or mm. uh, an, an artificial intelligence or something like that. Yeah, so it sounds like you're describing in some ways the kind of gestalt of things, right? That, you know, the, the machine can see the parts, right? But we see the parts and then how, it, you know, is the sum of, you know, the, the whole is the, the, the sum of all the parts, which then, you know, together can, you know, for, for many people can extrapolate some type of meaning uh, from that or what kind of utility that could have from that. So it, it, is, it is obviously tremendous and we, we as humans do it or try to do it all, all the time. So I was very happy to see in the book, uh, you kind of put front and center one of my favorite philosophers, one of the uh, most underrated, I would say. You know, there's, he's kind of sandwiched between Martin Heidegger and and Jean-Paul Sartre and, and a few other guys in the 20th century. But uh, Merleau-Ponty is, is, uh, is tremendous. I, I've, uh, I've really, really uh, admired his thinking and his philosophy for, for many years. Um, and so it was nice that you look not only to philosophy or phenomenology, but that you look to the work of Merleau-Ponty to kind of draw heavily on a kind of uh, structural or theoretical way of understanding uh, perception. I mean, his main magnum opus, but per phenomenology of perception, is is obviously tremendous on this. I guess what drove you to looking there as opposed to, um, you know, cognitive science uh, in various papers there, or looking at um, different types of machine learning, let's say, or there's all these other ways you could have looked at it, but you chose. Uh, Merleau Ponty and phenomenology, and and curious as to why that's kind of your uh, foundation for, for exploring these things. Right. So the book is about Merleau-Ponty. Mm. I mean, that's the, that's the sort of hidden story here is I wanted to write a book about Maurice Merleau-Ponty mm -hmm. and I, but I wanted to do it in a way where people could access it mm -hmm. uh, because he is notoriously uh, complicated, um, as a writer, dense and murky and, but deep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I wanted to write about phenomenology of perception, and some of my philosophy friends uh, that know the book said, "Good luck, I mean, good luck with, <laughs> good luck with that." Uh, They've been trying for years to, like, you know, interpret this, and so you go ahead, you give a stab at it. <laughs> exactly, knock yourself out. Uh, but uh, and but they said the same thing about the last book I wrote, which was called Sense Making, and mm. that's a book about Martin Heidegger. Ah, uh, very so, nice, very nice. So and so that that. Um, was something I wanted because I, th I think the phenomenology of perception in particular is a book that a lot of people should study. It's a very deep, extremely relevant book. Totally today. agree. Totally agree. Um, but so, so I wanted to write in a way that people could access. Um, and in order to do that, you need to uh, use some of the examples he uses, which are from the world of art mm. and music mm -hmm. and uh, sort of visual, very simple examples that explains how our world works. Mm -hmm. um, and you used the word gestalt before. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, one of his main inspirations is gestalt psychology, mm -hmm. uh, also from the 20th cent, late, late 19th to early 20th century. Um, so I just shared that interest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he has so much to say about modern technology in particular. Um, so, so yeah, so the hidden, hidden agenda was, could it, would it be possible to write a book about Moïse Merleau-Ponty mm -hmm. that 100,000 or 300,000 people would read mm -hmm. um, and, find, and find inspiring? Mm. Yeah, well, you, you do it very well. I mean, it's, uh, as I was reading this, I was like, oh, yeah, I see where this concept's coming from. Oh, I see where he's pulling. I've, I've read Phenomenology of Perception a handful of times, and um, I always get something out of it. Uh, uh, everyone talks about being in time by, by Heidegger, which is phenomenal. It's, it's a, I mean, a masterpiece. Um, but I, I think phenomenology of perception is, is very much underrated. Um, so one of the things here is this idea of kind of the primacy of perception and in terms of 
you know, people have these kinds of sayings about, you know, your reality is only your perception. How, how, how much of that do you feel is true, right? How much do you think that, you know, is there you know, the big question, right? Is, is there a reality that exists if we don't know it, if we don't know it from our five senses or from our phenomenological experience? Uh, is it important? I mean, again, this isn't a new question, but understanding it from the centrality of perception and why that's important uh, and how we're trying to interact with other people and interact with the world and space around us, you know, is, is that the case? Is is reality only a, a part of our perception? Right. Well, th- there there is this... Um there is a uh, talk that Heidegger gave in the 1920s where he lashed out against the industry that was being created, the philosophy industry that was being created, trying to answer that question. And he's saying, uh, the problem of other minds, like, are there other minds? Do they understand me? Is the world still there when I close my eyes? Questions like that. And he said that it's not the tragedy is that we're still thinking about those things because obviously we experience the world, um, we're in the midst of it, and we organize our, our life around it. So he, he, he said, it, it's not a bad question. It's just there shouldn't be an industry of philosophy uh, professions. There shouldn't be a philosophy profession dealing with silly metaphysical experiments when what we really should try to do is to describe social phenomena. Mm. Um, so, and, and in that sense, Heidegger and Meloponti are realists. Of course, there is a world. Of course, if you fall out of a window, you'll hurt yourself. Uh, you know, if there's a if there's an earthquake, uh, there is an earthquake. The question is whether that is um, a natural tectonic plates crashing into each other, or uh, is it the wrath of God? Right, and 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 both are can be the case in terms of experience. Mm. But the fact, but there is an a physical activity happening yes. and and it's thinking would the would the earthquake still happen if i close my eyes is is kind of a lame uh, lame sort of uh philosopher's mm-hmm. discussion that that he finds tragic that we spend so much time on mm. in 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 sort of a, this way how does perception happen within us Right, and then the meanings exist everywhere around us. You mentioned this somewhere in the book, and I, I, this is a very interesting idea of a kind of inward, outward kind of thing. Could you talk about how we perceptions are are ours? They're the things that happen for us, but the meanings are are kind of outside of it, or potentially outside of it. Could you talk about this this notion? Yeah, maybe, maybe you could say people say, is it subjective or is it objective? Right. 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 So subjective is my opinions. Mm-hmm. An objective is what science can measure. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- 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 those are relevant things, right? Of course, if I, hurt my, if I hurt my foot by kicking the door, you can't come and say it doesn't hurt <laughs> because that's my experience. And if you count how many stars there are on the skies right now, you can't say you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So, so subject and object, objective exists. But I think what he's interested in and what Heidegger is interested in is this sort of third type of knowledge, which is we, what we humans know is between us. We know what a city feels like. We know what, it feel, what, it, what a breakup feels like. Uh, we know things that we know other people also know. So it's kind of neither objective nor subjective, but more intersubjective, mm. right? Mm. In between subjects, in a sense. Mm-hmm. And that experience... Um, is what we share and what we know about each other. And sometimes we misunderstand each other and sometimes they're not completely overlapping. But I'm interested in that s- third type mm. of, of knowledge and truth mm. that there is in the intersubjective. Yeah, so maybe back to something you had said just a, a little bit ago that might be helpful for, for listeners. I, I mean, I've talked with a handful of people on the podcast about some of this stuff, so... Uh, maybe in a kind of a practical way, it might be very helpful here is with the Berlu Ponty and, and, and with Heidegger and with, with others, uh, Levinas to a certain extent as well, is this kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, 
three ways of seeing the world, right? Uh, in a sense, right? You can have your subjective experience, right? So how you feel about things. Your objective experience, right? What is usually kind of an object or another is incorporated there. And then there's the phenomenological experience, which usually people confabulate a little bit with the subjective. But really, it's the kind of strange, in some ways, idea of, uh, let me give an example here if I can. So I'm sitting in a room, you're sitting in a room, and there's wonderful books behind you. There's a you know, cloth uh, 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 piece hanging behind me that I, I've received, and there's you know, lights, and there's you know, the doors and pictures on the wall, and I'm sure things for you as well. And subjectively, I'm having an experience like this is from my perspective, my point of view, right? You know, I've, I've, you know kind of through the eyes and everything. Um, and objectively, I could, like I just did, name the objects and, you know, this is an eight foot ceiling and, you know, whatever. But then there's this third kind of way, which is harder to kind of quantify, which is what is the total aspect of the subjective objective that's going on that is contributing to my experience of sitting in a room with my feet on the ground, you know, with, with me sitting in a chair. And there's the phenomenological experience, which we, we place a lot of things into that and, and we receive a lot of things from that. So that's one example. But could you talk about this, mm, the phenomenological layer of experience, how it's different from objective subjective mm-hmm. And, and where our perception and then the perception of the other is kind of loaded into that. Right. Since you have read the book several times, mm-hmm. The Phenomenology of Perception. It's been a while. You, it's been a while. <laughs> you have, right, right. Um, and it's also torture to do it. It's, it takes a while to... to, to I, I give myself a solid month when I do it. And I, and I just, I, I kind of put everything else on hold and I just kind of focus on that. <laughs> you're faster, you're faster reader than me. It takes a while. <laughs> but but he, would, he would have examples of um, philosophers uh, in the past that have different versions of that story, mm-hmm. right? So an empiricist's version would be that how, how do you how do you experience a room the room you're in? Well, an empiricist would say there are there's data, mm-hmm. in, and that data is somehow captured by your retina and your eardrums and your sort of perceptual apparatus, touch, light, you know things like that. And s- somehow they have no real good explanation of this, but somehow that adds up to the meaningful room you sit in and the conversation we're having. Um, they can't really explain how you add billions of data points and suddenly that becomes a meaningful, like, a, a world saturated with meaning and familiarity. Then you have a, a rationalist uh, uh, description, which you know can't maybe might be one example of, but this idea that there is data in the world, it somehow is captured through our percepto, perceptive apparatus and then there's some sort of mechanism uh, in our brain or in our mind that, that translates that into the meaningful world that we sit in. Mm-hmm. And both the critique that Meloponti has of that is that that's too intellectual. Mm-hmm. It's as if it's all about the brain mm-hmm. and the mind and being aware of what you're seeing. Where he's saying it's much simpler than that. If you describe what's actually happening, when you see a bookshelf behind me, you immediately understand what that means, which world that is in. It's part of your world. And you, com- and you can, not by adding up a lot of data points, but just with an immediacy, understand what that is like. Mm. So should an empiricist walk into a room and see a chair, they would, they would have to take the color and shape and the, and the structure of the chair and then somehow figure out that's a chair where humans would walk in and they would not, there's nothing between uh, walking in and seeing chair. Mm-hmm. It's just, compl- it's right there in the experience. Mm-hmm. And we know that chairs are connected to tables and connected to uh, uh, forks and knives and chicken and milk and other things and means dinner. And it has a whole range of social practices uh, around it. Mm-hmm. So well, I think what Meloponti is saying it's, it's neither the empiricist nor the rationalist um, 
ex- the description of how humans experience things. It is the gestaltist. It is the idea that we see holes like dinner party or school or interview. Mm. Um, and, 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 and describing that phenomenologically is a much more, is much better version or a much better description of how our perception and our attention works. Mm. Uh, then, and then this sort of guesswork convoluted theory uh, that, you know, an empiricist or a rationalist would have. And then he's saying th- the idea that it's all rational and in your head and sort of uh, clear to you doesn't account for the body. It doesn't, in- mm-hmm. doesn't account mm-hmm. for uh, the fact that we are experiencing the world from a body mm-hmm. and not from, uh, you know, a camera or a sensor or mm-hmm. something like that. Uh, we are experiencing things um, physically mm-hmm. as well. Um, so, so he's kind of introducing two things, right? He's introducing perception. Mm. Heidegger doesn't have anything to say about that. And he's introducing the human body, uh, which Heidegger doesn't have anything to say about either, mm-hmm. uh, as the way we see the world. So suddenly it's no longer data, meaningless data, atomistic data. It is human worlds that is at the core of experience. Yeah, no, you, you explain it very nicely. And <clears throat> I'll just say, I want, I want to come to the body because that's central for Merleau-Ponty. There's, there's another um, a component here where cognitive science and neuroscience, I guess, you know, the, the, these worlds have been exploring some of these, I think, the, these ideas. Um, and, you know, predictive processing is a, is a really big kind of thing within uh, cognitive neuroscience at the moment. And I actually, I talked to somebody, uh, she's, she's quite lovely. For, uh, she's brilliant. Uh, who, who does a lot of work on this is merging this idea of predictive processing and, and Merleau Ponty's work, uh, in yes, uh, Hippolyto, she's, she's great. And this idea that, you know, predictive processing, yes, is still explaining that, we have an idea of something in our heads, the chair in the room, when we come into the room, all of these kind of you know, schemas of sorts. Um, and then we're just confirming or, or disproving or, you know, uh, or, or whatever in our brains kind of cognitively. But, and that, that can be true cognitively, but it still misses the kind of uh, phenomenological experience. And, and, and I would agree here that the biggest... I would say the biggest contribution of Murillo Ponti's philosophy uh, with the philosophy and the um, potential application of what that means is, is, is huge, is that these experiences uh, emotionally, uh, cognitively, uh, and just general experience, uh, uh, experience of a person is happening through a body, right? It's not happening through a machine. It's not happening through a, a lens. It's not happening through a computer somewhere. It's through a body. And uh, okay, so what is a body, right? And a body is a, is a bunch of those things, right? It's a bunch of parts. It's a, bu- it's a brain. It's a cognition. It's, <laughs> excuse me, sensation, emotions. And when you put all those things together, kind of like this you know, gestalt of sorts, is you're having that, that experience, right, of what it means to perceive things and the other and things like that. But I think he goes so far, you, you correct me here, I could, I could be misremembering uh, this. If you don't have the body, you don't have human experience anymore. Like the, it, you don't want to overemphasize the body, right? Many people do that in, in kind of strange ways. But you definitely don't want to de-emphasize or undermine it either. And, but that it's a critical ingredient, it's a critical variable of the, the human experience. And so uh, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but, it, but maybe more so just say this kind of really important claim that he makes and kind of where he kind of sticks his flag in the phenomenological movement of the importance of, of the body for, for human experience. Right. There's so much to geek out over here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> so, so, that, so there is the question of cognitive science. Um, and we, maybe we should discuss that. But mm. first, the role of the body is, of course, that's what he wants to write about in that book and wrote about later um, and tries to describe how a body experiences the world. Um, I, I think some people have said that Phenomenology of Perception is a book about sports. Um, 
And the reason, you know, it makes sense in some ways because he's describing human perception at its very best. So if you see a great football player uh, or a great um, tennis player and you, and you look at how they perceive the world, they're not focusing on anything. They're not, uh, there's no spotlight honing in on something in particular. They see everything and nothing at the same time. In the book, he calls that panoptic attention. Mm. So panoptic attention is kind of a glaze of attention. Mm. If you see a great basketball player, they see everything uh, when, they, when they are on the pitch and they know how to get in and out of situations based on a rhythm. So these are deeply embodied experiences. Now, if you ask that basketball player, that football player later, what, what went through your mind mm. when, you, when you did something amazing, they wouldn't know because it's not happening in the mind. Mm. It's not a cognitive process mm. in the sense of thinking about anything, knowing anything. It hasn't, has nothing to do with that. It's an embodied relationship to the world. Um, and I think we know that in a much more banal way, uh, you know, we who are not Neil and Messi or someone like that, we, we know some of these things by just walking down the street. Yeah. We experience the world when we walk down the street in a lesser way than Lionel and Messi, but still uh, uh, physical, right? It's in a sense we are, because we stand upright, our heads are turned towards the world and we're not thinking about anything. We don't know why we went from our door to, you know, two blocks down to pick our children. It just happened. So, so what he's trying to describe, I think, is when human perception and human attention is at its, at its absolute peak, there's no thought process involved. Um, so in a sense, we've described humans as thinking things and thinking is what's most important about us, mm -hmm. is you know, what Aristotle and others would say and I think modern cognitive science. But what he's saying is, no, actually, the times when humans are at their best, there's no thought process, and we can't describe it afterwards. Yeah. That's why when you ask football players after the match, what did you do? They have very little to say about it, mm -hmm. even though what they did was exquisite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's almost, it becomes so automatic that you're not aware of it, right? Which is, I mean, people do this in sports is, is actually a good analogy of doing that it, tennis is a great one too F football yes but tennis is i mean there's so many so many parts to just you know swinging and hitting a ball and making contact and hitting it over the net and that's not to go for you know different types of strategy you want to use and under reading the other person's uh style and game and but you can't be thinking about, okay, I place my legs here and then I you know, have the, the racket head here and then I place the wrist here and then I swing. You, you can't think about all that. I mean, because you're not going to hit it very well. It has to be so automatic you don't think about it. And there's a, right. a, a, there's a thing we call playing tennis, which is just doing that, <laughs> right? <laughs> playing football in, in almost this kind of seamless way where, you know, People are moving and the ball's moving and then, you know, it, it becomes really, you know, again, automatic. So, but, so, so you were going to go with the, the cognitive science piece as well. So people make a lot of to do about the cognitive science, which again, I, I, I like cognitive uh, science, but um, it does, I mean, there's some people that do emphasize the body, but it does seem to be underemphasized a lot. It is very much, you know, brains in our heads, you know, all, all of the, our, our intellect, our our ability to reason and all that's, I think, I think the understanding I have is that the reason they make a big deal about that is because it is distinct from other, any other animal on the planet in terms of, you know, how our brains are and our density and things like that. Um, and, you know, we, we value it very highly in society and in, in our work culture. I think intelligence is uh, one of the highest rated things for hiring people and keeping people. So, I mean, it's obviously very important not, not to, to, to minimize it, but it does seem like the, the body and, and the impact of all these together is, 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 uh, is not emphasized as well. I mean, so what do you think about this kind of uh, connection between cognitive science and, and, and some of the work that he's done with the body? Right. Um, I, I think the science is amazing. I think it's the things you can do now with, 
uh, fMRI scans and mapping uh, what's happening in the brain uh, is, is exciting and a, a, as a research project. But I think people are taking it quite far in terms of what we can actually, what we actually know about it, what we can actually uh, learn from it. And I've seen, you know, there are, there are people selling brain scans as they, as they, as they show people advertising and therefore target the advertising based on how much the amygdala lights up or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's just silly. Yeah. Um, it, it's so early days. And I think the need for having cognitive explanations of things, mm. how are people thinking about this and having a scientific sort of natural science uh, answer to things are so strong in us that we end up vastly over-interpreting what we actually know and what we have. Um, Hubert Dreyfus, the, the, mm -hmm. the, who, who was a philosopher at, at Berkeley and a great um, American philosopher, mm -hmm. he called it the myth of the mental. Mm -hmm. so, so this idea that everything that's important about us is mental and it's something we think about and it's uh, uh, the best version of us is when we're thinking and being rational animals. Um, and I think what, what, what he got from Meloponti is, no, actually, some of the things that we're, when we're at our best, isn't, isn't when we are, it's not when we are aware and thinking explicitly about anything. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is in, it is embodied. Um, so if you take, you know, you could take driverless cars as an example. Uh, when I learned how to drive, I used 16 hours, something like that, to learn how to drive. Mm -hmm. uh, and later, I've hopefully gotten better than I was after those 16 hours. But, but certainly, I, I knew I could drive a car in 16 hours. If you give, if you give a, a driverless car 16 million hours, uh, they're still worse driver mm. uh, than, than we are. Now, why is that? Well, if you drive down 13th Street, where I live, there is a school to the left when you drive down the street. Now, I know, because I'm a human, I know what schools are. Mm -hmm. And I know the, the gestalt mm -hmm. of schools. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to think about it when I drive. Mm -hmm. I know that when it's 2.30 and the kids are about to leave that school, I know that the dynamic of the entire street changes. And I need to be aware of stable objects moving through the street. If you're a driverless car and you have sensors and cameras and you're just packed with data uh, that can be absorbed and processed inside of a car, it doesn't understand it with the same efficiency mm. as I do. Mm -hmm. So I need very little information, really, because I understand the gestalt, mm. where a car would have to have millions of data points for that. Right. So th th there's no real thinking in the sense that that's a school. A school at 2.30 means that kids are going out. Kids can go wild if they're not picked up. Uh, you know, all those things can happen. Um, but, but, but there's not much sort of thinking happening, mm -hmm. even though it's much more efficient than a driverless car. Mm. Uh, and I think we, get, we don't get much credit for that mm. these days. It, How amazing yeah. we are at those kinds of things. Based on very little information, mm. we can process things with our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that that's, I, I do, I think it is underestimated of how much, how often we do that in these small moments in everyday uh, uh, life, and how 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 you know tremendous it is. I, I think it's I think it's super important, and you know I think that thinking about it and understanding it more helps us not only appreciate it more, but only refine it and enhance it. So a big thing that one of the, aside from the body uh, in the in the the emphasis that Merleau Ponty places on on the body, one one other big, big thing that he plays. He's not the only one, but I, I've really liked the way that he talks about it is this idea you were kind of getting at it. There is space. I, I find space, um, very interesting as a concept. Uh, so I'm not talking about deep space, like out with, you know, with the, the moon and, <laughs> and the, and the astronauts, uh, the space that we reside in, right. And the space that we were always navigating uh, through. Um, so I'm curious for your thoughts. You were talking about a little bit there. I have actually some, some, some thoughts on, on space and the experience of that, but how, how, uh, you know, and temporality is connected with it as well, but how do you view 
the phenomena, phenomenology of, of space with how we're interacting uh, with other objects or with other people or things like that. Um, and, and why is that um, so important? Right. Well, Meliponti has an example of a train. So he says, if you stand on a, on, a, on a train track, on a train station, and you see a train coming towards you, you see a tiny dot far away. And then you wait a little bit, and suddenly it's a train. Mm. So it's, first it's a, it's a train, it's a, it's a dot far away, and suddenly it's a train very close by. It's not an even ramp. It's not a ramp of even increments getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm. It's either far or very close, mm. and either dot or train. So the, our experience of space is also gestalts. Mm. It's also happening in the same way as we talked about before with gestalts. Mm -hmm. um, an example I use in the book is the is the American artist uh, James Turrell, who's a who's a, a amazing uh, American minimalist. And he builds these, I suppose they're sculptures, but it's a, it's a room you sit in. You sit on a bench and you look upwards towards the sky. And there's a cutout, either oval shaped or sometimes rectangular, uh, in, the, in the ceiling of the room. And when you see that, when you look up, it's as if the sky has been pulled down and become the ceiling. Mm. So the sky is close. You can almost touch it. Mm. But then what happens when a when a bird flies by and you see a bird against the sky, suddenly it snaps back to becoming the sky and far away, mm. right? So it's not, there's nothing in between the two. It's either ceiling or sky and all that. And, and, and so our, our, our mind or our bodies, I suppose, work in a way where we work in where, where we experience the world and perceive the world as holes. Mm -hmm. And what he's, what he's trying to do with that piece of art is to show us that. So he's, he's said several times, he said, I'm trying to show how we see, and I want you to see yourself seeing. Mm. Uh, so seeing space, in a sense, or distance, mm. uh, is, again, holistic mm. and gestalt, like mm. uh, in gestalts. Mm -hmm. So th that's what he has to say about that. So here and yonder or close and far are experienced as holes mm -hmm. or as gestalts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there, I think it was Heidegger that mentioned about, he didn't say as much about space, at least not being in time, but this idea of closeness and, and, uh, and, and uh, how far away it is. He, that's kind of also saw it in that way. If I, there's this interesting thing, <clears throat> Um, I've, I've thought about this. I, one of the times after I was reading Phenomenology of Perception, I really sat with this idea of space. And um, I, it, it's, it's from somewhere in that book. I can't remember where it is, but there's this idea of, for me, that when you're in a space, you're placing yourself in the space right now that that sounds like almost a tautology but here's what i mean when you're when you're in a house right when you're in your house or apartment or flat or you know wherever you reside and you you live there there's nothing there's nothing magical about the space it's it's four walls or a, a, a ceiling and and a, and a floor right and some windows maybe and some doors it it the space, it doesn't exist in some ways, right? It, 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 you're just maneuvering through rooms, right? That you've, or someone has erected or, or, or put together. And yet, many times when you go through the rooms over and over, the bathroom, when you wake up in the morning, uh, your closet, when you get dressed, your kitchen, when you make coffee in the morning, uh, whatever, when you go to bed at night in your, in your, in your bed, you're in the space. So there's, there's, a, there's a body or multiple bodies in the space. Now, most people would say like, yeah, like you just sound ridiculous. Like, of course, like you're living in the space, like you're making more of a thing than it is, right? <clears throat> but there's a, there's, there is this phenomenological experience. So two kind of examples on this. When somebody um, 
there's just you know, some cultural norms and things that are also you know implicated here. But but the the general idea is, if I invite you over to my house, let's say you come over and say, hey, you know, Christian, you come over. We're gonna have a nice cocktail. Well, I'm gonna make you dinner. We're gonna have a good time. And you say, okay, yeah, I'll come over. And let's say uh, let's say you come over and and you come to the house. There's a door between the outside world and where I'm at inside, right? And there's, there's, a, there's an importance there, right? There's a boundary there. I have to let you into the space where I reside at home, where I feel safe and secure and it's mine and whatever. <clears throat> and uh, there's this funny thing is, is when, I, when people come into my house, I give them a tour of the house. I show them the house, right? Some people, you know, make fun of me about this and they say, that's very strange to do. And other people will say, why wouldn't you do it? So I usually tell people, I show people the house. Quick tour. I don't have a very large house, but this is a three floors. And we go to the basement and you see all my stuff and you're on the first floor and you see the living room and the dining room and all that. And then I take you upstairs. And I take you upstairs and I show you my bedroom. But you don't go in the bedroom. Why? Why don't you go in the bedroom? Well, that's a private space. That's a sacred space. Okay. I, 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 I take you down the hall and uh, I show you my daughter's bedroom. Oh, no. Not even going to go in the doorway. That's a, that's a private space. It's a sacred space. But it's not in one way, right? If you just use the kind of rationalist notion, it's just a room. It's just, just ceiling, four walls, and a, and a floor. There's nothing special about it. Even if there's like things inside of it, it's just a room. But it's not just a room, right? People live in those rooms and they put themselves in the space. You're living in the space. And that's why we have these, sure, there's some norms and some cultural things and things like that. But there's a sort of line, there's a boundary there that the space gives purpose, right? And there's that experience of What's in this space all the time, right? There's a kind of privacy to that. It's the same reason if you come home and your door's a little bit open and everything's thrown about and someone came into your house and they stole some of your stuff. You're not, people don't care about the TV and the computer that's stolen. It's the violation of you're in someone's space that you weren't invited into. And it gives this aliveness to the space and you're in the space, right? You're not, you're not, you're not, not in the space. And so there's a, I think a, a real, in a very experiential way, there's a part of us that lives literally in the space and how we feel and how, and how it, it kind of is kind of back towards us of how we say, how we, how we feel at home or that notion of it, where we, you know, we, 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 show all of our emotions and that we're angry. We, we shed tears. We're happy. We have parties. We have people. We don't. We have our private moments. But all of that is sort of, it's in our memories, but it's, we access those memories of where it was and where it was in that space. And yeah, so I mean, I'll stop there. But I mean, what do, what do you think about this idea of, of the space of how we put ourselves in the space and how we have that experience of it? I mean, you, you might get, I mean, it, we're borderline between banal and deep here, but the, the, the deep stuff going on in what you're saying, you could say in a different way if you think about time. Mm -hmm. So if I say to my daughter, oh, it's, oh God, it's already, it, it's already three o'clock. Mm -hmm. Then she would say, dad, it's actually three o'clock the same day the same time every day. There's nothing <laughs> to be surprised about here. Right. But, but, but that's a kind of, that's the way a, a clock would see it. Not a way a mm -hmm. human would see it. Mm -hmm. A human would experience three o'clock as late or early mm. as uh, uh, surprising or uh, a slog of waiting towards that. So, so space, time, color, distance, light, all those things are experiential. Mm. And, um, what you're describing there is, of course, some space. Some space is different than others. Uh, you know, if you walk up the stairs to the Supreme Court, 
mm-hmm. you, you, it's, it's so obvious that that's not just another step of marble. It has a deep meaning and saturated meaning mm-hmm. to it that makes it different from all other spaces. You know, at, um, at uh, Passover or, or at Eid, that, that, that's just, you know, an amount of time, you could say, it's just a day or a week or whatever, whatever uh, that kind of moment is. You could say that's just another week or just another hour. Yeah, but it has a different texture. Mm-hmm. Experientially, it has a very different texture. Mm-hmm. Um, I, th- I think that's what you're trying to describe. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you take it to something even more kind of practical, let's take money. Mm-hmm. Right. So, so if you were if you're an economist, you would say a dollar is a dollar, mm-hmm. right? And you can add money up in a spreadsheet, and more is better than less, and you know so on. Um, but then there there's different kind of money experientially, mm-hmm. right? So let's say a hundred dollars you use to buy groceries is a hundred dollars, but a hundred dollars you save up for your daughter's education. Mm-hmm. It's also a hundred dollars, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. but they're de- so experientially so different. And a bank or someone that wants to service you, you know, financially, should understand that different kinds of money have different kinds of texture and different kinds of experience related to it. Mm-hmm. And that money is not money. Mm-hmm. Money can be different things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so you you said space, but time mm-hmm. or money are are layered with meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, here's two more examples, color and sound. So the color green, the Pantone strip of a, of a green color, and you put it on, a, on grass, say, mm-hmm. versus a Jaguar race car, mm-hmm. it might be exactly the same color that hits your retina. And you can define that scientifically as the same color, but one has a grassy feel, Mm -hmm. and the other one has a race car type Mm -hmm. of feel, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, The same exact scientific input to your retina can be placed in completely different worlds. It's the same with space and time, right? Mm -hmm. Or with sound, if you play play a a middle A on a piano, Mm -hmm. it's 440 hertz, Mm -hmm. I think, something like that. Uh, And it hits your eardrums with exactly that amount of like that, uh, that frequency. Frequency. Now, if that A is in is part of one chord uh, of, a, of of another sequence of chords, it sounds jazzy. Mm-hmm. And if it's in a different sequence of chord, it feels more like baroque, mm-hmm. you know, classical music. Yeah, it's the same exact frequency frequency that hits your eardrum. But it just it's in two different worlds. Mm-hmm. So you could say, well, that's just 440 hertz, mm-hmm. or that's just a green color, or that's just the room, or that's just the buck. Actually, yes, sure, mm-hmm. that's correct. But this it doesn't it, it doesn't tell us any truth about the experience of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think the experiential side of it, or the phenomenological side of it, is important as well, uh, and it's something you can study and describe and mm-hmm. you know learn about. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I think a, a, a more recent example for, for listeners is this is where we really understood this when during, you know, the, the pandemic in 2020, where everyone was at home and, you know, home is, is a lot of things, but it can't be everything for everybody all at once, right? It was, you know, the place where you go and have dinner on Friday night. It was the gym. It was work. It was uh, the movie theaters. It was, it was all these places. And this is more of a kind of uh, functionality of things. But we realize that there is an importance to a space for certain things and that there's nothing. Sure, you can work from home. Sure, you can watch a movie. Sure, you can have a, uh, an exercise machine. But doing these things in a different space gives it a kind of a purpose or utility. There's nothing magical about doing that. But there is a there is a separation, there's a boundary there that for whatever reason for us as humans helps us to, I think, delineate and, and kind of make appropriate discriminations of here I do this and I'm in this mindset or I'm in this place to do this and, and then I'm not. And so I think, you know, I, we, we saw a little bit of that of like, well, we, we appreciate the space to, to be able to 
go to a movie theater, you know, go out to a, a restaurant or even to go to a, a place to work. Um, and, you know, we don't feel as uh, crowded in some ways mentally and our experience of things, I think, is, is, a, is was a, was a, at least for myself, is a, a big lesson I learned. It's like, wow, space is super important, like to do things in a particular space, um, you know, for that function or purpose uh, is, is actually very important. Um, so, I mean, yeah. you're onto something interesting about like f- to do phenomenological research here. So, mm-hmm. um, a way to study a phenomenon is to take it away from people. Mm-hmm. Right. So, if you want to understand the role of the mobile phone, you take it away from someone and see how that feels. <laughs> you 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 don't understand how much it saturates your everyday life, and how per- it permeates your everyday life until you lose it. Um, and the same, I think, happened during the during the lockdowns mm-hmm. that we suddenly knew what a movie theater was mm-hmm. in a different way because it was absent. Mm. Yeah. We knew the role of the school of our children because they couldn't go there and we could see what, what, what that left out in their life. So quite often, I think, and this is also a phenomenological point, that we experience the world through familiarity, or how we're familiar with something. And it just permeates our everyday activity. And we don't, it's like fish, the water to the fish. We don't really see it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or do, we don't experience it. And it's not highlighted right in front of us because mm-hmm. we're just so engaged in it. Um, but when it disappears, you can suddenly see it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the, so looking for absences, like wh- yeah. when, when something is absent, might reveal more than when it's present. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I've done that in my, in my research over the years to take things away from people mm-hmm. and see what happens then. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's illustrative and illuminating when you take somebody's car away. Oh, oh absolutely. It's, 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 a, it's an interesting way in which we not only get used to things, but how we, how we are or things about us that are uncovered when we're doing those things with those certain things or in those certain places, which is very, very, very interesting. So, uh, one other big piece here is uh, this perspective of the other, and many philosophers have, have written about this, including Merleau Ponty. Um, how do we pay attention to the details and the gestalt of other people? I mean, it could be other objects as well, but in this scenario, with other people, this this idea of we have our perspective, perspective, but how do we we observe somebody? you know, kind of from our perspective or, you know, the objective aspect, but then also understand that they might have a similar way or there might be some similarities, but then also not. Where do you find this idea in terms of kind of, we started in the beginning of observing or paying attention to things. How do we do that with, with the other in ways that are instructive? Right. Well, that's what social sciences are. In a sense, or what supposed human to be. Science is <laughs> it's supposed to be. Yeah, exactly. Um, I taught a class for a decade at the new school in mm. Manhattan, mm-hmm. where I was teaching for a while, and uh, called Human Observation. Mm. Um, and it was basically, how do you understand other people? Mm. Um, and there were t- sort of several steps to it, but one was get rid of your own opinions about them. Like, start out, you can't fully do that, and you can't correct all your biases, but you could at least try to stop yourself when you have strong opinions about something, mm-hmm. which turned out to be very difficult for many students because they're taught to have opinions and argue for those opinions rather than mm-hmm. looking. Um, and then secondly, so that's the first step. The second step is pick a phenomenon, like pick a social topic, a social phenomenon that you find interesting. That could be money or winning or uh, buying a house. It could be many sort of simple everyday things having coffee, and then try to observe how other people make sense of that. Mm. So don't come from your point of view and just have opinions about it. Try to look at people that are uh, trying to win mm. and figure out what winning means. So go look at the chess players on Union, at Union Square and figure out the dynamics of winning mm. and whether winning is always taking the other person's king or not. Winning can be many things in that sense. Um, so pick a f- social phenomenon and then describe instead of conclude. Mm. Just describe what's going on. And if you describe 
the phenomenon with enough texture and enough uh, detail, you will start seeing a, uh, how a phenomenon makes sense to someone else. Um, and if you do that with an open mind and with, uh, you could say, in an organized way, not just random sort of feeling what other people are feeling, but actually looking in an organized way, suddenly you can see the structure of meaning that these other people have. Mm -hmm. And I would argue, it's not very fashionable anymore, but I would argue that we humans can do that with each other. Mm. That you do, even, though, even though I'm from Denmark, it is possible for me to go to Chile or to um, Hokkaido and try to observe what makes sense to the people there. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I, I won't get the full picture. I would misunderstand things. But I would also at least try to figure out how their world makes sense mm. as a world. Mm -hmm. so, so, the, so observing humans is what anthropology have done for 120 years or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, sociology has done it longer. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it's a practice you can be good at and that you can teach mm. and that you can learn. Mm. Uh, and, and the way to do that is get rid of your own opinions as best as you can describe instead of having opinions and concluding, mm -hmm. and then figuring out what the structure is to those descriptions. Mm. Well, this is, this is great. And this is more of the, uh, the practical side of, of the book towards the end. Uh, there's, there's nine lessons. Some of them might you mentioned there, but the nine lessons are learn to see what's really there. Uh, observation hinges on obsession. Good observations always include the observer. Observations are not opinions. Observation begins with systematic watching. Uh, your mood matters, uh, work like a bird, perceive with the eyes of a hawk, and observation must be done with ethics of character. So you can talk about uh, uh, all of them or some of them, but what are these kind of uh, lessons or these ideas you give at the end of the book to help people to kind of have better ways of, of observing and, and paying attention and kind of in our world? There, there is this book that I spend a whole chapter on called The Peregrine by a writer called Jay Baker. Uh, who wrote this book in the 50s or 60s. And it is a book about watching peregrine falcons for a whole season. So they arrive from the north, probably from Norway, to Essex on the, on the eastern side of London. And he then follows them through the entire season before they leave for the north again. And he, organ he, he watches these animals in their context. So not just what's the color of the feathers, but how do they interact with their entire environment? Um, and describes what, uh, what, not only what's it like to be a bird in that sense, but also what's it like to be somebody watching them. And he ends up being completely uh, merged with the environment he's in and understands it at a level that makes it possible to describe it to us. He's also happened to be the poet of the sky, he understands, he, he has a, his, the prose quality is just extreme. And it's the best observation I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I spent a whole chapter on it. And these lessons that you talk about is kind of a tongue in cheek kind of extraction of, uh, of what J.A. Baker would say would be the rules mm -hmm. for a good observation. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'm just trying to show that there's, this is a book about birds, you could say, but it's actually a book about observation mm -hmm. um, and something you can use in all, all aspects of your life, um, including professional life. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the last place you would think you would find insight uh, about human observation is a book about birds. Mm -hmm. And when I give it to my students, I usually give it as the first thing to read. They're saying, <laughs> we signed up for a class on human observation. <laughs> Not ornithology. Like, what is this? <laughs> what, the, what the hell is that? <laughs> Uh, but but they, but after you know after they read it and especially at the end of the semester they come back and say that's the best part mm. like that's that's when I got mm -hmm. that's when I got it mm. the 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 obsessive nature of of observation and the and the organized nature of it like how organized you have to be mm. in order to do it mm. yeah I think that that's again it's 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 how are we making these things practical and I always find that you know. <clears throat> I read uh, lots of philosophy and have lots of friends that, that uh, are philosophers or teach it. And the question I always come to is, is uh, well, this is great, but, you know, 
most people aren't going to read philosophy, which is, you know, I, I somewhat get it in some ways. It is dense and tough. And, um, but it's like, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we extrapolate these ideas uh, or export these ideas without kind of watering them down? And I think that's what uh, your, your book has done so well is not water it down and really get the tangible, uh, you know, kind of functions of them. Uh, others have done that as well. And Simon Critchley is a big guy that does this and he's great. And, um, so I guess the last question I have is, is kind of a general one. You can, you can, you can take it where you want is, you know, how does phenomenology help us, you know, practically, uh, you know, help us to understand how we can use our perception to pay attention to our world, to others around us and to continue to, you know, uncover uh, things about our ourselves and and uh, and our humanity. Hmm. Uh, well, I've made a career out of being a phenomenologist, in a sense, hmm. and a and a highly commercial career, right? Hmm. Uh, trying to make things. So, for many years, I almost twenty years, I worked uh, with different companies around the world, particularly in South Korea to try to understand the future of media and how humans interact with media, which seems to be an important thing. And it has changed certainly over the last 20 years in completely transformative ways. Um, and the way we did it was to take in, have in front of us uh, what, how do people interact with media as a question and the phenomenon of TV, of the TV and then try to describe that as it changed over time. So describing how practices went from sitting back with a remote control, changing channels on your TV, to what we have now, which is, um, which is micro uh, communities like the one you have, for instance, that are probably global and are centered around you as a node um, with deeply specific interests, right? So how do we go from, from the remote control to what, we, what you and I are doing right now? And what's the process of that? And for me, it's been f keeping the phenomenon in front of us when we did, you know, in that case, 50 studies over the, over the last 20 years. So this is, um, you know, what, 50, 40, $50 million worth of research mm. over, over the course of, of, of those years trying to understand how are these behaviors changing. But the only way we could do that was through phenomenology. Like how do people experience mm. the, the, the world? How do they experience media? And how, are they, how is that changing our behavior? And during that, if you, if you imagine you can actually see that over the course of 20 years when the world is changing, a company or a technology, is, you're, it's possible to make bets on how that future is changing. And in the case, that's why people want to pay us to do it, was that it was possible to change uh, how a company served its customers in a sense in the end. So phenomenology can be highly, like almost uh, mercenary in a <laughs> sense, right? Uh, it, it, it's an extraordinarily effective way of um, s seeing patterns of behavior and making bets on the future. Um, so, so I've done that my, my whole career, uh, and I've ha I had around a hundred, uh, people that were all trained phenomenologists, uh, to work as you could say at mercenaries, if you wanted to, for big corporations, for governments, in order to understand how people's experience of something is changing. Mm. Um, so for me, it, these ideas are philosophical and we should study them as philosoph philosophical and on their own terms and in their own right. But they're also just extraordinarily helpful tools if you want to build anything, change anything, yeah. uh, fight against anything, promote anything. Understanding how humans experience a particular phenomenon should be the start of it. And it's kind of an alternative type of data compared to economic data or big data or other kinds of things like that. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's an effective tool in your work life. Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah that, that's, that's great. I mean, I think it's important for people to hear how it can be used in, a, in, a, in the real world, out, out in society. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's very, very, very uh, helpful and very important. 
the uh, the book is called Look: How to Pay Attention in a Distracted World. Um, Christian, where is the best places uh, to find you, or where do you want to point people to? Anything in particular? I think they should go. I mean, I'd like to point people to read the Peregrine. Mm-hmm. I think they should read that book before they read mine. Mm. Um, I read it every year because mm. it makes me happy. Mm. Um, so I'd start there. I do have a website, mm-hmm. which is just my my surname matsberg dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, they won't find much there, but let's just start. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, this has been uh, such a wonderful time. I was really looking forward to, to talking with you. Always excited to talk about Mario Ponti, and, and uh, you were you were so fantastic uh, talking about his philosophy and how it can be used. And so I'm I'm very grateful. So so big thanks. Thank you. Thank you. This was fun. 